now I want to discuss what makes an underpainting good. So for that, I have a sketch of the painting that we're going to be doing. So see this? Is that visible? Mm -hmm. Okay, you're going to notice that in this drawing, what I did is I didn't focus on any details. Mm -hmm. What I want is I want the geometric shapes that compose this image in the simplest possible way. And I'm looking at these shapes as abstract properties. What do I mean by that? So you see this shape over here? Well, it looks I like you did it sort of like a planar head almost. Yes, yes, just like, see that shape over here? That's right. the shape of the cheek. I'm right. just looking at it as an abstract thing that if I had to do like a graffiti rendering of this, like I had to cut out a stencil and do like a Che Guevara shirt, <laughs> that's what I would want to get, right? Right. So in an underpainting, you're not shooting for more than that. If you start making an underpainting that's too pretty, that everybody falls in love with, you're ruining your process because it's going to make it so annoying for you to cover it up with paint. You're just going to be like a, a slave to the underpainting. You're going to be like, oh, adorable little underpainting. Like, I don't want to ruin you. And then every paint that you put on there is never going to be good enough. Mm -hmm. So no good. We can't make an underpainting too pretty. We want to make okay. an underpainting correct. That's it. Okay. Just make it correct. And if you can make it so simple as to not fall in love with it, that would be the best case scenario. Okay. Because, uh, again, this, this is a very big liability for you because people who come from a background in drawing, I'm preparing you in advance, your underpaintings for a while will be prettier than your paintings because you have more experience in drawing than in painting. So it makes perfect sense that your underpainting is going to be good. So every painting is going to be accompanied by an annoying feeling of now it's time to ruin my underpainting again. Yeah, I've had, get, I've had experiences doing get, that. And get used to it. So Embrace bad. Embrace the pain. Embrace the pain. <laughs> it's going to happen. It's going to, it happened to me for years. Like, and honestly, sometimes it still does. Like I make a killer underpainting and then the painting's all right, but I kind of like the underpainting more. It's, it's how it is. All right. Now I'm going to say, I swear we're going to start painting, but I'm going to say like one more thing. Okay. And <laughs> I hope this is not overwhelming in terms of information, but it like is necessary information. Um, so why don't we paint on a white canvas? This is another huge mistake that uh, amateur painters make. And it goes like this. In drawing, we need the white because we're working against the white. If I didn't have white when I was drawing in charcoal, nothing would shine, nothing would be bright. But in painting, if we are treating the passive white of the canvas is something that helps us create value differentiations, we're not utilizing the power of white paint, the power mm -hmm. of using white and lights in the painting actively. And painting is a medium where you need to operate by using light actively, not passively like in drawing. And what happens is if you leave any areas of your painting white at any point in the painting process, what happens is you're mixing your colors and you're putting them down. And let's say you're mixing uh, whatever, a highlight on a forehead. It's never going to look as light and as bright as the white paper. Mm. Because the white paper is so overwhelmingly white that the result of all these paintings who started on a white surface is they're all too light. In general, like all the colors are constantly way too light because they've been mixed in competition with the white surface. Nothing will ever be as light as the light surface. So we don't want this competition. If I'm working on a brown, as soon as I put in a white paint, it's like, bing, it, sh it lights up with, with brightness. That's what you want. You want your first light stroke to already be explosive. You don't want to wait until you cover everything up. Way too annoying. Really hurts the color mixing. All right? Make sense? Yes. Sorry, should have said yes. Perfect. Okay, I'm going to start painting. So okay. you're going to watch me do this quickly like a demon uh, so that you can watch and ask questions. And then it's going to be all you. And All right. So 
what do I do when I start? Grab a big brush, grab a lot of solvent, and the first thing I want to get rid of is uh, the embarrassment of working in front of an empty surface. I want to carve out my composition from this empty surface, and the first thing that's useful for me is to mark distances from edges because the shapes of the background are the largest shapes available to me, and I want to work big. So distance from this edge until I get the head, about yay much. Mm -hmm. Distance over here, there's kind of a triangle. Around here, we have something going like that, and then a triangle going like that. And then here, this distance is very easy to measure. It's kind of like this. And then we have this kind of diagonal, and this kind of thing, that kind of thing, followed by that kind of thing. Very loose. Da da da. Da -da. Da -da -da -da. Boom. Very incorrect, but everything is here. You know, I know where my background is. I know where my figure is. I just measured what's the distance from here to here, roughly. You know, this is, this is still open to change. But I started by getting everything in my frame as quickly as I can. All right? Now I'm going to make corrections. Adaptations, fix those shapes up. This diagonal beautifully continues this diagonal. So mm. very important to remember that. I'm gonna chop into that, gonna get that dark shape over here. I'm gonna get that dark shape over here. This is a very light shape that looks kind of like that. Don't worry, it's gonna to come together. I'm demonstrating the mindset of working loosely in the underpainting and allowing the beauty of how open oil paint is to modification to play in our favor. So all of this is basically shadow except for the hand, which is, you know, roughly, roughly here, looks roughly like that. This thing can be smaller. Just get all this to be dark. Not futzing with anything yet. That's what I mean. Don't make it pretty. Just give yourself a roadmap so that you know where things are. All right. Now let me get at that background. And while I get at the background, it's a good time to adjust the shapes that were incorrect with the figure. The background is a way to draw the figure. So now I lost all the marks I made here. That's okay. I did that on purpose. Because next time I find them, they're gonna be better. Make sense so far? Mm -hmm. Okay. So unlike working in graphite, where everything is very, like, as you called it, reliable. Here, you know, if, if working in graphite, I make the, the comparison that working with graphite is a little bit like uh, working in marble if you're a sculptor. You just kind of put moves there and they stay. Working with oil, especially in the underpainting, is sim more similar to working with clay. You put something in, you want to take it out, you take it out, you want to put it in, you put it in. It's a lot more fluid, literally, but also conceptually. Okay, let's keep that going. So this whole thing is shadow. This whole thing is shadow, 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 shadow. Smaller. Very easy, make something smaller, no big deal. Now, if I want to erase, I take a new brush with nothing mm -hmm. on it. I dip it into my Gamsol, or in your case, the Turkanoid, and I just remove. Another way to do this is with a, with a rag. That's mm -hmm. also possible, but yes. Just 
removing this. And if any questions come up, you let me know. So the main differences between drawing and painting, again, are texture. I wouldn't call it texture. Texture is just one iteration of this. But a okay. uh, better way to put it is that there is no uh, direct relationship between amount of material and any kind of variation, whether it be color, value, or anything. They're independent. So materiality is how I would call it, that you need to choose where you want to make it thick, where you want to make it thin, where you want to make it textured, where you want to make it opaque, where you don't. All that stuff, you get to choose. In drawings, you don't. Right. So you see what I'm doing? It's like not not trying to make it pretty too much i'm just like just putting things where they belong so that later i know where i am where i'm going I'm not too worried about details yeah very loose very very loose with i i feel like manet right now well manet is a great way to look at it you know it's yeah. except for the fact that manet is you know, very heavy on texture, and we don't really want that right now. No, but just he copied uh, the yeah. old masters in the Louvre, so. Well, who did it? Exactly. That was his job. He got paid to do that. Oh, really? Oh, yeah. I think there was a story of uh, that being how, uh, you'll correct me if I get this wrong, but how Monet met Degas. I think that might be true, yeah. That, and that Degas, being the badass that he was, wasn't even copying it in a sketchbook. He was copying it onto a zinc plate to make uh, a dry point, at, a dry point uh, print. Oh, wow. So badass, like going to the Louvre with a piece of copper and a needle and, and you know. I would do that. That is so cool. I, I would, would do that. I would also do that. That's so cool. Yeah. I took printmaking in, um, in Venice. I love printmaking. I, I worked as a printmaking tech at Parsons. Oh, that's awesome. Yeah. Printmaking's great. Yeah, it's so much fun. And so with printmaking, actually, this, again, brings me to, like, the same kind of example that I was using at the beginning of the lesson, that in painting, you want to make sure that you don't torture your, your painting with, with overworking any area. In printmaking, that's the kind of thing that you never, ever can do because all the stuff happens on a plate, you right. know? And then the paper is always so fresh. It doesn't matter like how much labor you put onto the working of the plate itself, the paper always feels like you only touched it once. So yeah. that's part of why it always has this like luminous beauty to it because you only touch the painting once, like it's gonna stay super fresh. And trying to get that done with painting really requires us to think of the palette like a printmaker would think of their etching plate. Mm. You know what I mean? Kind of. Kind of. Well, kind Almost. of. Almost. I'll take kind of. <laughs> Where is this? This is what I've got so far. All right, so you totally crop this, like, fully. Yeah, yeah. All right, which is unjustified, but we can go. <laughs> it's totally unjustified because you did it by making the figure larger, not because you have a different format. But it's okay, we'll live with it. I always do that, I'm sorry. No, it's all right, but that's kind of why, I mean, okay, here, here's, here's I'm going to pause to explain this, but... It's not, it's not to like reprimand you or anything. It's just because I want you to be in control of your compositions. 
not your compositions in control. In control of you, yeah. So I want us to set a benchmark for what the composition is going to be and then just try to hit it as a practice. Like, okay. let's just see if we can decide on what the composition is and then hit that composition. So yeah. right now if you're attached to this underpainting, that's fine. We'll just assume that you told me, Ken, I like Velasquez's composition, but I can do better. And I'm going to crop, I'm going to crop it closer and I'm going to go like, okay, well, that's ambitious, but let's rock and roll. But in the future, <laughs> the compositional decision is super critical because when you're working on your own piece, you have something in mind. You have to make sure that in the underpainting, the primary goal is to get things to be, you know, in scale and in frame the way that you expect them to be. That's part of what this exercise is for. So for this time, we're going to roll with it if you want, if you don't want to restart it. No, but I in, don't. But in general, yeah. the role of the underpainting is to be dominant over your, you know, arrangement. All right? Makes sense, right? Yep. Okay. Because, you know, we, it, this always happens. You're like, oh my God, this is going to be amazing. It's going to be like the family and the cat is going to be on the side and the cat gets cropped. Yeah, yeah. You can't, you can't let that control you in this way. It's just not, not healthy for a painter. That's smart. I will try my best not to do it in the future. Yeah, you know, and if you're very, very studious and you want to continue this painting next time, you could go the extra mile and make us a new one to continue. <laughs> you could call that your homework. Okay. Get one done that is like the, as close to Velasquez's composition as your surface enables you to do. Okay. Uh, what kind of paper would you suggest? Do you know uh, Arsh's oil painting? No. Let me show you. One second, let me just see. I am like obeying my own rule. I figure out that like my, my face was too low in the composition. I'm moving the face upwards. I don't care, you know? This is the, this is the stage at which to do this because everything is fluid, everything is flexible. Later, if I want to move it, forget it. It's going to be super annoying. So now is the time to make use of the flexibility that the underpainting offers you and not to fall in love with something you just did in 10 minutes, but rather demand perfection, compositional perfection. Notice I kind of went into it now with a smaller brush. Okay. I feel like now I need to make some smaller adjustments. So when that time happens, it's okay to switch to a smaller brush, but you don't have to switch to a different mindset. It's just because some of these shapes are difficult to get at accurately with the big brush. So I'm just chopping up that face. You notice what I just did? I just like chopped it in uh, and I'm gonna be making adjustments that were just a little bit too clumsy with the large brush to, to achieve. Okay. How's yours looking? Yeah, I can show you. Yeah, show me. Okay, is that better with the hand gone? Yes, ah, oh, okay. hugely improved. Yes, great. Good, yay. Great. <laughs> See, I can, I, can, I can correct myself. <laughs> Very good. <laughs> as much like a masterpiece is just a sketch it's just a sketch it's just, it's just a it's not even a sketch you know it's just a way to learn how to paint that's it yeah you, know, you can make these so many times you know i i sketched this painting at the met like many many times and i will probably sketch it many more times because every time i do it i learn something new it's so brilliant isn't it the ear yeah. the the intimation of the ear Right. It's just, uh, it's so good. Just a hint, you know? The whole, yeah. The whole, like, it's amazing, but the masters, they weren't masters of painting. They were masters of getting away with not painting. I know. That's, that's something that once you understand, you're like, oh, basically, it's all about how I can not paint it, not how I can paint it, like how I can get you to paint it in your imagination. Yeah. That's, totally. that's the true mastery. Totally. It's, 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 you know, magic. 
It so really now is. I understand that I needed to move the back of the head. No worries, moving the back of the head. Everything is fluid. Everything's doable. I don't compromise. The underpainting is really the best time for you to not fall in love with anything you're doing. And, you know, if, I'm going to say it again, if I were strict, we would have restarted it. But we're not. Starting it. You're going to do it for homework, right? Right. I will, I promise. Okay, good. I will. We're slowly, like, slowly getting into that mindset because to learn to learn classical art you can't you really can't do something in 10 minutes and then just like let it dominate you it's just never gonna work i want to show you i don't know if you noticed the degree to which i just moved the face in did you notice that or did that? Here, do it again. Oh, I can't. <laughs> I was just going to say, wait, what are you? <laughs> like, you here and huh? I just did this. Just okay. Because I am looking at the angle between the face and the hand. Mm -hmm. And there needs to be like a, an actual angle between them that my drawing was not expressing. And if that means that I need to go through the painful motion of moving the face, I move the face. I'm, I'm yep. You gotta do it, even though it's painful. Compromising about any, like right now, the only thing I care about is getting the composition to be organized correctly. So if something is standing in the way, like a pretty face that's in the wrong spot, that face is a goner. All yep. right? That's just, you know, tough love face. It's yep. just, we have to, we have to get into this mindset because we're, we're seriously at risk of having the painting control us if we're not asserting uh, this, this uh, mentality. Okay, soon I'm gonna show you how this moves forward even further, very soon. I'm just erasing massively because this was way too large. And then this can come up a little bit more, which is good news. Much better. So I started with a head that was way too big, but now it's finding, finding its place more comfortably. Always difficult, the size of the head, so when it's so small inside of the format. Yeah. Well, and I think... Uh, what? The thing with this painting is that you're immediately drawn to the face and everything else is, like, irrelevant. Right, right. That's, and that's, so that's that, why you make it bigger, because you, you, it feels bigger. Right, but, but we have to understand where that when that thing is capturing us and you know uh how do you say uh count have countermeasures in place to not let that happen to us now try to take it upon yourself to you know actively decide i'm going to keep it simple I'm going to purposefully keep it simple because getting these very few shapes you're going to notice we've been working on it for roughly the same amount of time me and you and i'm resisting by all means adding any more information all i'm doing is i'm changing the locations of existing information like what isn't in the right place i'm only interested in place right now just where is it so that later when I come in with real paint, with real color, I'm gonna just not have to worry about, is it in the right spot? So in order to be able to get to that point, uh, I'm gonna really benefit if I manage to keep it as simple as humanly possible.
And it's actually like really nice because this painting is so complex that it'd be nice not to have to worry about everything at once, you know? Yeah. So I'm separating my concerns. It's like right now, I'm only worried about a very small number of things. But those small number of things, you know, I'm, I'm taking them very, very seriously. Like, for example, now I discovered that this shoulder needs to move a little bit. So, you know, no mercy. I'm going to move it. How's that, uh, how's that underpainting looking? Oh, much better. Thank you. Much better. I'm trying to be super loose, it's hard. <laughs> Don't forget about the loose. The loose is, loose is just a tool. Mm. You manage to do this while being tight, fantastic. There's no, there's no, uh, how do you say it? There's no like scorecard for looseness. Looseness is just how I think is most beneficial to arrive at the result. But what you're being graded on is not looseness, it's simplicity. Okay. Simplicity, like how can you take a very complicated phenomenon like this portrait and render it simply, like really, really simply. That's the key here. And now uh, from looking at it, my, my suggestion to you is check out the width of that forehead because there's a slight feeling in the reference that he's kind of looking upwards and people who look upwards the more upwards they look the smaller their smaller forehead, the forehead yeah right so help us see that foreshortening a little bit more i'm moving it up no mercy no mercy there we go oh i love it no I mercy I took a picture so I wouldn't be sentimental about it. Got, it. got it. Okay, whatever gets us there. We have to leave the sentimentality like for another time because we're trying to learn. So, yeah. You know, the thing about Velasquez is like, for example, right? I would totally understand you being sentimental if we were working, like, for example, you were drawing a portrait of your friend who lives in Australia and she's just here for one day. We have to nail it. She's going to leave. Velasquez isn't going anywhere. We right. As many times as possible. If you told me, listen, Ken, like I have a model tomorrow and they're leaving. And I need you to give me all the tips for drawing the model fast and well, because that's my only chance. I'd be like, all right, I'm with you. Like we have to, you know, it's an emergency. But since this is not an emergency and Velasquez isn't going anywhere, I really want to prioritize like, learning from it as opposed to like rendering it perfectly because it's so unlikely that your rendering or my rendering will be the best rendering we make of this painting in our lifetime. If I try this again in five years, gonna look better. If you try this again in five years, gonna look better. So this is just a reflection of what we need to do now, where we are right now with our knowledge of painting. And this knowledge is constantly expanding. So there's really no need to be sentimental about it. How's that thesis? I agree. Great. I'm seeing, let me just try to, to accentuate the diamond shape in a, in a comical way, just to explain what I'm seeing. I'm seeing like one, two, three, four. See that diamond? Got it. How I, how I sacrificed the painting for us. See that? That's, that's the spirit. This is the laboratory of diamonds. We don't, no need to be attached to it. There's really no need. Here, there. There's my diamond. Much, much better. This has been immensely helpful. Great. The thing you need to know about, about a painting that you're going to continue is that it's always better, if you're in doubt, to leave things softer than they need to be as opposed to sharper because softening something up later really hard sharpening something up later really easy okay so you're like on the border between making something really defined and making something really like foggy choose foggy if you're gonna continue the painting always choose foggy how's that wow so much better wow wow 
Yes, hugely improved. Hugely. Good. Yeah. Now the one thing, the bottom of the nose, pull it to the right because you're 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 airing on that verticality again. Okay. You want to make sure that you know our head is going to try to make us uh, render every portrait as something symmetrical because we're used to thinking, oh, you know, heads are symmetrical. But this guy's in three quarters, and everything that's happening on the left is larger than the things that are happening on the right. So this nose needs to kind of bite into that cheek that's on the right. Got it. Okay, it's fine. Now, I want to do one cool thing together. Yeah. Get that done. I don't want that hand to feel like it's so light, but yeah. Do you notice how the line is? Before you take it out, if you could evaluate my opinion and see if you agree that the line is like hurting the illusion. Do you notice that? I do. Yeah. I already took it out though, unfortunately. It's just that, you know, in reality, there really aren't any lines. You know, it's just spots that meet other spots. And if both spots are light, it's very common that there will be no line in between them. And if both spots are dark, it's very common that there will be no light in between them. And it's easy to explain this to you because if you're an art history nerd, you want to be thinking constantly about the man, the one and only Caravaggio. Yes. Right? Yes. Shadows, right? The way that they connect. There's no difference between the shadow of the background and the shadow of the right. Feet, right? There's no lines ever. So he basically started this whole Baroque thing. Oh, so much better. Way, way, way better. Good. Much, but this angle, still looking vertical. Do you oh, know? you're right. And as I was saying, uh, what Caravaggio does to shadows, everybody started to do to shadows and would also be beneficial to do to lights. You know, the way shadows connect is the same way that lights should connect. You know, what, if there's light next to light, we don't need to create an artificial separation because that's not realistic. In, real, in, in realism, when two bright things are up against each other, the, the border between them disappears and we want to embrace that. So no more lines between noses and cheeks if they're both in the light. Agreed. Agreed. Okay, I've done this for two for long enough. I've been having fun with this. Uh, I'm gonna do that cool thing that I was talking about. Uh, and I'm gonna do it with some partially dry paint to make this deal even sweeter so that you can see that it's not too bad. And it goes like this. Thank you for watching. I really appreciate it. And if you enjoyed this video, please don't forget to like and subscribe. For longer videos, please consider supporting me on Patreon at patreon.com slash kengoshen. For lessons, please visit my website at kengoshen.com slash lessons. See you next time.